as you refer to it, that the Congress set up. One has been, I think, noticeably and unsuccessful, and one has been very successful. The first reason was that we hoped, everyone hoped, I think, that who was participated in it, that it would, in fact, cut down in terms of the gross quantity of, of weaponry and dollars uh, represented in that weaponry that was transferred. To that extent, on a, on a chart that you would draw and the dollars of weapon value transferred, it hasn't been very successful. But a second, and I believe more important reason why, and I was there from 72 on when we were doing this also in the Senate, was the foreign policy component of it. Because at the outset of this program, we all said, the one thing we all agree on, it is a tool of foreign policy. And what happened was we had presidents, uh, Democrats and Republicans over the previous 15 to 20, probably over our history, who were in fact treating what was viewed as an economic decision independent of the foreign policy consideration that the Congress said we now want to be part of. And to that extent, I think it's successful and has been successful in the sense, you, you may argue Congress wasn't right, but it's been successful and it accomplished what Congress set out to do, and that is be part of the game. I'd like to add one point, uh, one additional point, and I think the gentleman's, uh, the questioner's point is well taken. It does positively impact upon our balance of trade uh, situation, but uh, it is one of the potential upsides to arms sales. But to reiterate General Scowcroft's point, if in fact we have a circumstance where it becomes the motivating force behind the sale, not only have we sometimes not had in production military <coughs> equipment that our military no longer needed, what we've tended to do is our arms merchants have decided to go sell what was also not needed by the third country. That particular weapon system. That has occurred too. So it's a yeah. double-edged sword. Yeah, it has. In your statement, at least as I heard it, was that there's an inconsistency between a transfer of arms, or between, potentially, between U.S. self-interest and uh, world harmony. Uh, um, and I would suggest that, that if, if that is part of your, implicit in your statement, that that is not correct. I think we're at a stage where one of my colleagues Southern colleagues in the Senate says, it's wonderful when conscience and convenience cross paths. And I think in arms control policy, we have the opportunity to have both conscience and convenience cross paths. For example, you mentioned nuclear capability. That is the overwhelming concern uh, for the entire world, it seems to me. And there are instances where arms transfer can diminish the prospect of the feeling of urgency develop, to develop and or steal and or whatever um, a, uh, a nuclear capability. And conversely, there are cases, which I believe is a situation potentially in Pakistan, where massive arms transfers can propel the competing countries in the region to move toward the uh, greater reliance on nuclear. So it, 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 can, work, it can work to the benefit on occasion, and, but that's what I meant by I think we should do it case by case. They're really detrimental to us, and they might sometimes uh, be encouraged. I, off, I wondered, when you made that remark, whether or not this ally, in general, allied sales abroad don't, don't serve as a kind of safety valve in some ways for the tension in NATO, the tension I described earlier. And I'm wondering if we have a U.S. policy that on the one hand either tries to control those sales more tightly as some has, have subscribed to the, excuse me, ascribed to the previous administration, or a policy that tries to promote American arms sales abroad more vociferously, uh, particularly if you use an anti-allied argument, if they don't sell it, we will, uh, it, if we don't sell it, they will, in the process. I wonder if, in this respect, we don't run the risk of cutting down or short, short changing the safety valve aspects of things, and in fact, perhaps endangering the larger NATO allied market, which is where the, the real money, if you will, uh, often comes into play. Senator Biden? I think you're absolutely correct. You pose the problem very, in a very articulate manner. I think we get back to the, uh, the fundamental question. What is our foreign policy and what should NATO be? How should it be made up and how effective is it? 
And part of the question of whether or not it's effective relates to the interoperability, the standardization. Standardization is not merely motivated. It is not primarily motivated by the requirement of the French to get in on the deal. It's motivated by the question that generals know better than senators, and that is how do you have a unified battle plan without having radios that can, inter that can receive one another's messages, without having spare parts that can be interchanged, without having tanks and planes and guns, et cetera, that are, can be used under a unified command, somewhat like a unified army. And, uh, and that is the motivating factor. Now, once we reach that decision, I think the Allies have a right to say, hey, wait a minute. Now, you ain't getting it all. We want a piece of that. And I think that we have to be willing to make that decision. There is a great deal of pressure from our domestic arms manufacturers to say, no, that we don't want you, quote, giving away any of our piece of the market. I think, just as we've done in many other areas of foreign relations, we have to have the courage or the, or the foresight to say, we're going to figure out what component what portion you're going to make up, United States, what we're willing to, what piece we're willing to take. Absent that, there is a great r risk being run in cutting off the safety valve. You are absolutely correct, because that's part of the, that, that, that's part of the plan. I believe because we haven't been willing to follow through on what is clearly in our strategic and conventional interest to do that is standardized, and the reason we haven't been able to do it is be, in large part is because of the economic decisions involved in it. Because of that, we have propelled to a greater degree our allies into markets that compete with us in the third world and many instances force us to make decisions that are marginally less detrimental than if we didn't move into the area. I think you, I think you mm -hmm. stated very well. General Scowcroft? I, I, I agree with, uh, with the senator, but I think, I think what we need to work on is the NATO part rather than the safety valve part. Because, I, I agree. Uh, you know, NATO spends more than the Warsaw Pact does on arms, and yet, you know, we're woefully behind in preparedness. One of the reasons is that each country goes out and builds its own little system. Uh, they don't work together. They're not standardized and so on. We are one of the biggest culprits, not only for economic reasons, but military, That's our own fair. military, tend to think that unless, unless it's our equipment, it's not good enough, and we have worldwide concerns, not just in NATO, and therefore we have to have our own unique equipment. I think we need to do far more than that, and we need to take the lead. Representative Dickinson? Uh, I don't disagree with what, what has been said. I, I thought maybe I, it would perhaps be helpful to put it in a little different context. Uh, for the past few years I've been a delegate to the North Atlantic Alliance or Assembly and uh, this is the question comes up there is an economic section a political section and a military section and I'm and on the military section and this question comes up every time we meet we, if we met six times a year that's how many times it would come up this two-way street the RSI and one of the th things that causes the breakdown is, is that uh, our NATO allies say, well, look, we're buying more weapons from you than you're buying from us, and so it's not fair. Mm -hmm. And the American reply is, well, look, you're not counting the cost of us stationing our troops in Europe, and if you put in the cost of what we're spending to station our troops in Europe to defend you, we're spending more than you're spending. So it's, uh, it goes round and round. But I think in, in the final analysis for your major systems, that I think the answer is going to have to be what we did with the F-16. That is, you're going to break down and uh, everybody that wants to get in on the act, all the countries, they make components. And General Dynamics is making part here and Belgium is making part there. And it seems to be working pretty well. And rather than saying, well, you, we'll build this airplane and you build that tank and we'll, we'll swap out. So I think that down the road we're going to find that's probably the most practical way to go. All right, next question. <coughs> next question, please. Uh, I'm Major Bill Hudson. I'm a uh, U.S. Air Force Research Associate at Advanced International Studies Institute. Congressman Aspen uh, indicated earlier he felt that arms sales or arms transfers actually had perhaps very little leverage. Uh, this seems to be the substance of what the panel discussion is about. I wonder if you could all reply concretely to the fact uh, or to the opinion. Do you think that arms transfers compare favorably to other 
foreign policy tools, diplomatic or economic, in achieving concrete results, such as basing rights, or more generally, leverage or influence. You want to start? Yeah, let me say, I think that, that uh, what I meant was that I think leverage is very often overstated, uh, and it's easy to anticipate a lot of leverage when, in fact, uh, the leverage may not be very great. And, and I can think of some examples. Um, one of the arguments is that arms sales give us some control over the use of those of that weapons because if you keep control over the ammunition and the spare parts you're then going to have some uh, the, the country a little bit on a leash as to as to whether the the, the stuff gets used or not um, but there are military engagements in which you don't use up a lot of ammunition and spare parts um, Israel bombed the Iraqi uh, reactor one 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 swift blow, and uh, you may have all the control over ammunition and spare parts, and it doesn't, doesn't give you much leverage. Also, countries have a way of building up enough consumables. I think the Shah of Iran set about a particular policy of trying to actually build up enough con consumables of ammunition and spare parts for the very purpose of, of shaking loose and getting a little bit more flexibility. Um, I mean, in the old days, back in the 50s, we seemed to have a lot of leverage. But back in the 50s, there was more than arms sales. We were also giving economic grants and all kinds of other economic aid. Uh, and the Russians were nowhere near as, uh, as uh, omnipresent as they are now. And so we had a great deal of influence. But I think people look back on that and think that the arms sales gave us leverage, when in fact it was a, it was a whole constellation of aid and assistance uh, and underwriting them financially, which gave us the leverage. I, I, it, it, leverage is a point, uh, but I think it's very often overstated in the arguments when it comes down to a particular arms sale. Yes, I call this genocide because it's become clearer and clearer that food is just trying to wipe out the idea of being dead and being Ukraine. It's literally a horrible thing that the Russians have done in Ukraine. And we're going to only learn more and more about the devastation. And uh, we'll let the lawyers decide internationally whether or not it qualifies. But it sure seems that way to me. Different. I just want to know what you suggest, because back then, when I was in your position, I was suggesting we bomb Belgrade. I was suggesting that we send American pilots in and blow up all the bridges on the Drina. I was suggesting we take out his oil supplies. I was suggesting very specific action. And isn't it interesting that we...